then let's go ahead and get started by talking about the things uh, that are coming up now. Today is Monday, June 28th. Uh, this is our, I don't even know, I've lost track now, third week, third week, something like that, one, two, seems right, I don't know, fourth week. Uh, it's all blurring together at this point. Fourth week, I think. Wow, the beginning of our fourth week. Wow, awesome. Uh, we are midway through our skeletal system, have a little bit left to finish up with that, and then your first exam is going to be Thursday. You do still have two more assignments that are going to be due. Your unit nine review is due Tuesday. I have made a decision that I was somewhat hesitant to make, but I think is going to be worthwhile. Normally, I don't, well, obviously we're in the classroom. It's almost impossible to have exams. You have your turn-in assignments in days when we're not in class. But I figure since we are on the interweb, I figure the best thing to do is to take advantage of the few advantages it offers us. And one of those is the opportunity to turn in assignments when we are not meeting in class. I don't normally like to have assignments due when we're not meeting in class because when people aren't meeting in class, they tend to forget about these types of things. But my concern is we're not quite as far along with our bones and bone features as I would like to be. And obviously we're not going to have finished it today. So uh, rather than having you turn it in tomorrow before we've had a chance to finish talking about all of our bone and bone features, I've decided to move the uh, 30 point skeletal review to Wednesday. Now it is due Wednesday at 8 a.m. So what I would encourage you to do is as soon as you get it done, submit it so that you don't forget. Again, if a late assignment, and that means 8.03 Wednesday morning, loses 50% of the grade and a 30 point uh, skeletal review becomes a 15 point skeletal review, which is a lot of points. So don't wait till the last minute to submit this. As soon as you have it done, submit it. Uh, but I do wanna give you the little bit of extra time so that you have Tuesday after class, especially for the lower part of the appendage. If there's things that you weren't clear about, this can help us going it over in the groups can hopefully help you to be successful to understand it since it is being graded for correctness. So I do think that is important. The other reason I'm making it due at 8 a.m. on Wednesday morning is because when an assignment is due is also when the key a will post. Oops. Obviously, I'm not going to have them graded and returned to you by Thursday when the exam is, but it is important to know this information and make sure that you got it correct. Anything that is worth 30 points and graded for correctness, do you think that those are things that are going to be emphasized on both the lab and the lecture exam? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So having that key posted and available for you at 8 a.m. Wednesday morning gives you the day to look at it and to study it to make sure that you understand the things that you did right and the things that you did not wrong to help you to be successful on Thursday's exam. All right. So again, if you want to turn it in tomorrow so that you don't forget about it and you feel comfortable with it, then great. Do that. Turn it in now if you're done with it. But if you're struggling with it, then I think uh, Tuesday's lecture can hopefully help, or really the lab when we're going over the bones and bone features. So I want to give those people who are struggling with it a little bit, a little bit more time and a chance for us to finish going over with their groups. So that is why I'm doing this. Okay, so please, please remember to make sure that you turn it in on time. All right, questions on any of that? Yes, Professor, I did have a question. Um, so I've never had a professor that curved a grade or anything. How, how does that work? Or have you already done that or? I have already done that. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a curve in the sense of a traditional curve uh, where I, with a traditional curve, you do a bell-shaped curve. So you have the same number of A's and the same number of F's and the same number of B's and the same number of C's. So I'm not curving it from that sense. Basically, and, and honestly, I'm not curving it the way that I do it in the classroom. Usually when we're in the classroom, the way I curve it is I curve the exams to the highest grade. So the lab exam is a perfect example. In the lab exam, if for instance, you got a 52 out of 72, uh, what would your percentage be? Some of you've all got your smartphones right there next to it. Someone plug that in. Tell me what percentage that would be. All right, come on, don't make me do it. 72.2%. What is it? 72.2? Yeah. Excellent. So that would be a 72.2% on the lab exam. 
But normally what I will do is whatever the top grade in the class, so say the top grade was a 65, then what I would do is I would curve it out of 65. Now, obviously the person who got a 65 gets the 100% on it, uh, but even you, if you got your 52, you get now 52 out of 65, and what's the percentage of that? 80%. 80%, excellent, right? So your grade just went from a low B up to, I mean, a low C up to a B. So that is normally how I do it in the classroom. I'm not able to, with Proctorio and the way it does, uh, the way it does things in that, I can't change the totals. So basically what I do is I figure out what the average would be if I curve to the top grade. And then based on that, I then there is a way, well, I can't change the total. There is a fudge points, which you'll see at the bottom of your, uh, of your exam. And so basically I add the points to everybody's score to basically bring it up to the curve that it would be. So in this case, it turned out both the lab and the lecture exam curved at nine points. So both the lab and lecture, which is again, a very generous uh, curve. A nine points on the lecture exam is you know 9% of a curve. So that's pretty generous. And on a 72, nine points is an even more generous curve. Uh, so that's how it worked out of, which again, shows you how poorly overall, even with the curve, uh, the fact that people uh, uh, overall uh, struggled. So yeah, so that is how that does. When you look at your exam, you'll see at the bottom of that, you'll see what you got right, what you got wrong, my comments, and at the bottom, it shows you what it calls the fudge points, and that's basically where I just add in the curves. All right, and it's already added in and included, so your current grade in the class, as it shows on Canvas, uh, is what I show your current grade to be in my official grade book. So again, I check that before I release them to make sure that everything is correct. Great question. Any others? And I should point out my grade book is always open. If you want to see exactly how I did the curve, what your rock score was, why I curved it the way it is, I'm happy to, to show that information to you. So you're always welcome to see that as well. All right. Any other questions? All righty. Then let's dive into lecture. All right. We have been talking about all of the fun and interesting physiological things that we can do with uh, bones. We've made bones, we have grown bones, we have maintained our bones, and we've even talked about the role that uh, bones play in our homeostasis of calcium. So as we talked about at the end of the last class, the only thing we have left to deal with for bone physiology is our major uh, homeostatic uh, imbalance, and that is dealing with fractures or breaks to the bone. When we talk about fractures, and here's the pretty picture from your textbook, uh, there are fractures are primarily classified in one of two ways. So these are general classifications. Let's go ahead and remind, write that to remind ourselves. And the general classifications of fractures are either closed or open, or what are also called simple and compound. And what is the difference between a simple and a compound fracture? Simple would just be like a crack and then the compound would be like a complete breaking. Not a bad guess, but no, these are general classifications. So we want to be something, it's going to be something even more basic than that. Maybe if the simple and compound makes it more confusing, I think maybe sometimes referring to them as closed and opened uh, might be more helpful. What do you think the difference between a closed and an open fracture is? Whether are you not talking about like? No, go ahead, Emily whether or not the skin has broken. Yeah, exactly. With a closed fracture, the bone stays within the skin. With an open or what we call a compound fracture, you can actually see the bone. So the bone is penetrating out through the surface of the skin. So typically when we talk about fractures, these are the two general classifications. As we talked about, that is a pretty generic classification. So luckily there are lots of different specific classifications for these as well. So maybe we should throw that word on there as well. There are lots of specific classifications for um, uh, fractures. Uh, and here we see, like I said, lots of examples of those. Let's take a look at 
one of the most obvious ones, the basic ones, and that is a transverse fracture. With a transverse fracture, and let's cheat and go to our whiteboard. And rather than even drawing a Dino bone, I will just draw, draw the diaphysis of our Dino bone. A transverse fracture is of course a fracture that goes across the longitudinal axis. Right, all bones, uh, long bones in particular, have a longitudinal axis to it, and a transverse fracture is one that goes across it. Right now, one of the things is that transverse fractures and many of the other types as well can be displaced. What does it mean if the fracture is displaced? Like no. the bone itself is not where it should be, kind of like. That's a good. Way, that's a good way to describe it. I like that. Absolutely. What happens with a displaced fracture is that basically, when the bone breaks, it becomes misaligned, so the two ends don't line up anymore. Right. Now, a small displacement uh, can still be a closed fracture, but in most cases, when you have that open fracture, uh, for it to penetrate through the skin, it obviously is, is severely displaced. So when we're talking about different types of fractures, we can have those traverse. And traverse are, are actually one of the more common ones that can be displaced, but some of these other types of fractures can be displaced as well. Here we see a great example of a displaced fracture that's not a transverse fracture and stuff like that as well. So that's a basic one. Let's talk about a different specific classification and that is common muted. Notice with a common muted fracture, instead of just having the one bone that is broken into two pieces, Basically what happens with a common muted fracture is the bone is broken into three or more pieces. This is where you get more of a shattering of the bone. Now, is this a common type of fracture to occur, for instance, in infants? No, no. who's more likely to have their bones shatter like this? Grandma. Older. Yeah, elderly individuals, absolutely. Poor grandma, like we talked about when she rolls off that changing table, right? Her, she doesn't just break her hip, she shatters it. With those bones, remember one of the things we talked about, the flexibility and the give of the bone comes from those collagen fibers. They give it that flexibility, they give it that give. But as we know, the collagen fibers are where we deposit our bone matrix. So as we age, we end up getting less and less collagen fibers and more and more crystal in it. And so what typically happens is the bones get more rigid, more hard. And then as we also talked, as we age on top of that, you then have a decrease in bone density because remember our rate of resorption is gonna be happening faster than our rate of deposition. And so you get these more fragile, uh, weaker, less flexible bones. So this type of shattering type of injury is much more common in someone who is more elderly. Now, of course, right, when I refuse to take the garbage out for the umpteenth time and my wife takes a sledgehammer to my uh, femur, right, is it possible to fracture a young bone? Sure, absolutely. Uh, but like I said, it is obviously more common in elderly individuals. Conversely, something that is not as common in elderly and much more common in adolescents or adults are spiral fractures. Spiral fractures occur from an excessive twisting of the bone. As it mentions here, these are common in sports fractures. Uh, you are running across a field playing soccer and you step in a gopher hole. And as you step in your gopher hole, you get that sharp twisting of your foot that can cause the type, this type of a spiral fracture. And again, with my limited drawing skills, I'm not even gonna attempt to draw this on my little Dino bone, but you get this a twisting of the bone, the spiraling fracture that occurs. And notice this is another one that can commonly be displaced when this occurs. 
Uh, this sometimes happens with adolescents. Little Jimmy is bouncing on the couch and starts to fall towards the glass coffee table. So mom grabs to pull him away from that. And as she twists his arm, you can get that kind of a spiral fracture uh, to the humerus or something along those lines, or at least that's what you tell Child Protective Services. All right, those types of twisting forces uh, can cause these types of spiraling fractures. The key to a compression fracture is you have a bone that basically is receiving some type of force in both directions. This is kind of an acceleration type of fracture. These are very common with falls. And notice with the fall where this is likely to occur is on the vertebral column. Basically what happens is you're roller skating or you're skateboarding or like your little Timmy on our first night of sleepaway camp when I was in fourth grade, he was stand, sitting up on the top bunk of a bunk bed and decided to jump off. And as he jumped off, rather than landing on his feet, he landed on his butt because he thought it would be funny and ended up compressing his vertebral column. He had the acceleration of him coming down uh, off the bed uh, and then hitting the floor. And as a result of that, he got a compression fracture in one of his lower vertebrae on the very first night of sleepaway camp and had to be rushed to the hospital and never came back. This type of injury typically crushes the bone, like I said, is common in the vertebral column because it's what gives us our vertical axis. But we also see these types of compression fractures in individuals who fail in suicide attempts. I mean, I'm sure it happens in those that are successful with suicide attempts, but if they were successful, we really don't care so much about the uh, broken bones. But what happens is, right, uh, someone jumps off of a bridge, uh, it hits the water and again, whoops, wrong button. I wanted my rectangle again. As they hit the water, you have the acceleration of the downward from the um, jumping off the bridge and then hitting that concrete like water from the surface. And so often they will get compression fractures within the long bones of their leg. So you can see in the tibia or in the femur, uh, you can see these types of compressions from them basically hitting uh, the water feet first during that failed suicide attempt. So like I said, these are common in um, falls in the vertebral column, but can happen in other bones as well. These are similar, but different from what we call a depression fracture. With a depression fracture, essentially, you've got the same kind of thing. You have a bone, but in this case, the acceleration is really just coming from one direction. And as a result of that, you basically get an indentation in the bone. This often occurs with head injuries. Something falls on a person's head right? Or like I said, you forget to take out the garbage for the umpteenth time. And instead of coming at you with a sledgehammer, your wife just uses a regular hammer and comes at you in the head, right? Of course, if you see her coming, you could always put up your arm and then you could get that depression fracture on your radius or your ulna instead. But basically what happens is you get this indentation of the bone, but just on one side. So like I said, this is typical with falls, why it's so important to wear your helmet when you're biking and you're skateboarding and you're rollerblading and things along those lines, uh, despite how uncool it makes you look. Or like I said, it can you see it sometimes in defensive wounds or things falling on people's heads or things along those lines as well. Now, if, if uh, like in your example, having your arm up to block it, <clears throat> if, if the bone is shattered per se is it would it still be considered a depression or would that no. be no exactly in that case it would be comminuted absolutely so yes if it would so you're right it depends on the force of the bone with a narrow bone like the radius it is possible where you could just get an indentation in it from you know a more minor blow but if the blow is severe enough where it breaks it you could get a transverse fracture you could get a comminuted fracture right so that type of that type of assault could produce numerous different types of fractures. So really, 
In this case, it isn't the action that determines what type of fracture it is. It's the effect that that action has on the bone. All right, a perfect example of this is our next one, the epiphyseal fracture, All right? This is a case where essentially you have a transverse fracture of the bone. But the key to this transverse fracture is where and who it is occurring in. Because essentially, if you think about it, in that immature bone, we know in that growing adolescent, there is that chunk of hyaline cartilage that is the epiphyseal plate. And while hyaline cartilage is indeed a solid matrix connective tissue, like bone, it's also made up of collagen fibers and a glucosamine and hyaluronic acid and things along those lines. And it's not made of the calcium crystal hydroxyapatite crystals, that bone is. So it is a weak point of a growing bone. And so a type of force presented to the bone that could cause a transverse fracture and if that transverse fracture just happens to occur on the epiphyseal plate, well, then that is an epiphyseal fracture. Again, this is no. another one. Oh, go ahead. I was, I was just crossed my mind. Is that like when somebody says that like their growth plate got damaged, like that kind of thing, like where they'll stop growing? Kind that of. is, so you're absolutely correct. That is the concern. As I was about to mention, this is another one that commonly can be displaced. Uh, because of the type of force that comes on it. But you're right. It is a bit of a more of a concern than a normal fracture would be. We know bones are pretty dynamic. And for the most part, they're going to grow back. And as we'll see, often will be stronger than they were before the break. But you're right. When these bones heal, typically bones heal by converting the damaged tissue into bone. And do, in this case, do we necessarily want to convert that hyaline cartilage into bone? No. no. So as a result of that, uh, during the healing process, it is possible that the epiphyseal plate may ossify prematurely. And now if a bone only has one functional epiphyseal plate versus two, is that necessarily going to grow as long as the one on the other side that still has two functional epiphyseal plates? No. No, and depending on when this occurs in an individual's life, right, you could be wearing custom-made shirts for the rest of your life, right? And while, again, having different lengths to your cuffs can be uh, uh, um, inconvenient, it's even more serious if it happens to a leg bone, right? So in a leg bone, if you, one leg is shorter than the other, right, then you get to wear fancy shoes for the rest of your life as well. So it can be something uh, that typically when it occurs, excuse me, <coughs> the doctor will monitor uh, more closely, but unfortunately there's not a whole heck of a lot that can be done to stop it from occurring. So when these types of fractures do occur, it is something that is watched more closely, uh, but there isn't a whole heck of a lot that can be done to resolve it. All right, and so obviously these can only occur uh, before the epiphyseal plate closes. So these only occur uh, prior to right 18 or, excuse me, 25, as we said, which is not 225, 25, which is when the epiphyseal plate closes. So if that's epiphyseal line, then it's not a weak spot anymore and it's not a concern. Which brings us to our last, uh, specific classification, which are green stick. And these are also ones that occur in uh, adolescence. Remember, as we talked about, uh, bones have a large amount of collagen fibers. And typically, the younger we are, have more collagen. We saw the effect of that on the elderly people. Elderly people have less collagen in their bones that makes them more brittle, more likely to shatter. Well, having more collagen makes the bones more flexible. So once again, we have some type of force that is pushing on the bone from the side. 
and that force is strong enough to cause the bone to start to fracture. So we get a little bit of a splitting of the bone here. However, these younger bones have so much collagen in them that the force of that blow is able to be basically compensated for where we get a compression. So on one side, we get the break, but on the other side, we get the compression of the matrix. And that compression of the matrix stops the break from going all the way through. So what you end up getting is just a partial break of the bone, just thanks to the bone's flexibility. And often uh, you will get some shredding of the bone as well where it breaks. Notice this is called a green stick because now that it's summer, it's still a little getting cool at night, but you might wanna go camping or even sitting at the backyard by your, um, by your uh, fire pit and you wanna make s'mores. And if you're out camping and you want to make s'mores, do you go to that brand new sapling tree and try to snap off one of its branches to be able to use that to make your, uh, uh, make your uh, roast your marshmallows? No, what happens when you grab and try to break that uh, sapling's branch off? Does it just snap right off easy as can be? No. No, it bends and it twists. And as you continue to bend and twist it, you do get this shredding of the, that young sapling as a result of that. And that's exactly where it gets its name is from that kind of green stick. And that's essentially what happens here with our adolescent bones. Again, this is most, most common in children uh, because of that larger amount of collagen in the bones. All right, so. We have now talked about our general, two general classifications. How many specific classifications were that? I wasn't paying attention. Seven. Excellent. Perfect, we've done that as well. But as we also know, anatomists love to name everything. So there are also lots of what we call specific types. Now, I could rattle off a whole list of these, but I'll just give you two. Two of these specific or special types of breaks. Again, anatomists love to name everything, uh, but let's go with the two that your book has pointed out. The first is an example of what is called a Coles fracture. Now, this is a specific type of break. So, typically with specific types, it is both a, a typical, a, let me say it this way, it is both a specific uh, injury in a specific location. So what happens with a Coles fracture is you're roller skating, you're rollerblading, or like my daughter, when she was in middle school, she was at a school fundraiser where they were doing one of those fun runs and she was standing at the front because she absolutely loves to run, but she also really loves talking to her friends. So her and her best friend were standing there at the very front of the line, uh, yammering, talking to each other, having a good old time when the principal said, go. And everybody started running except her. So what did she do? She got knocked over. You put your hands out to catch yourself as you're falling. And that's what happens when you try to catch yourself when you're falling, you get a transverse fracture near the distal epiphysis of the radius. Uh, it can include the ulna, and that's the key with the, uh, with the coals, uh, is that it definitely involves the radius and may involve the ulna, hers did. Oops, why did that not write? that again occurs as a result of a fall, trying to catch yourself with a fall. 
So that's why when you're like rollerblading or roller skating, they have those special hand pads with the metal in them that are supposed to help to protect you from this types of Coles fracture. And of course, why is it called the Coles fracture? Because Bob Cole. There you go. Good old Bob Cole was the first person who described it for a, a medical journal, and so they named it after him. Which actually brings me to my absolute favorite fracture. My absolute favorite fracture is a POTS fracture. A POTS fracture basically is a, a spiral fracture of both the, radi uh, the tibia and the fibula. Uh, from either stepping into a hole. Oh, wait, hold on. Uh, at the distal epiphysis. From either stepping into a hole. Oops, I might say hole. Or off a curb. And that's actually what happened. Good old Bob Potts was walking down a street talking with a friend. And as he was talking to a friend, he wasn't paying attention to where he was stepping. He stepped on the edge of the curb, which caused him to violently twist his foot, breaking his quote unquote ankle. It's not really an ankle, breaking both the tibia and the fibula at the distal end of the epiphyses, near the distal epiphyses of these. And while he laid there in pain, he thought, hey, this would be great to write up for a medical journal. And so that's what he did. And so they named it after him. So he injured himself and instantly thought, hey, I should write this up for a medical journal. They did, and they stamped his name on. All right. Like I said, there are dozens and dozens more of these specific types or special breaks that are given fancy names, usually after some putts who, uh, who uh, wrote up about it. But again, this gives you a couple examples of those. All right. Questions on that? Now, clearly in looking at this, we can see that not all fractures, not all breaks of the bone are the same. So clearly with these not all being the same, they're all not necessarily going to heal the same way, but they will still use the same type of general processes. So the easiest thing for us to do is to take the most simple of these a transverse fracture, and using that example, describe how a bone would heal from that injury. And so that's what we're going to do. Now that we've broken all the bones, what we need to do is to repair them. So let's do that. And like we usually do these physiological processes, let's do it twice. We'll do it once on the board. And then once we do it on the board for this one, you should just watch and think and listen and, uh, and, and think about what it is. And then we'll go through it with all the pretty pictures and all the pretty words later. All right, here is a typical bone. We know that typical bone, uh, long bone, diaphysis has some spongy bone along the center, bone marrow in the middle. And of course we can't forget our periosteum on the outer surface. There you go, there's our typical bone. And like I said, for argument's sake, in this case, we'll just go with a really simple transverse fracture. All right, so we break a bone. What do we know about bone as a connective tissue? Highly, highly vascularized. Excellent. And that means there's a lot of blood vessels. When we break the bone, do we just break the bone and all the blood vessels are intact? 
No. So our blood vessels rupture. And when those blood vessels rupture, what's going to end up happening is we're going to fill this area with a big, huge swelling of blood. And what would we call such a structure? Hematoma? Yeah, exactly. Now, Remember, we form this hematoma, but the other thing that happens when we burst this, these blood vessels is we disrupt the blood flow. Obviously, blood's not going to be able to flow through here as readily as it would before. And that's a problem because we know we have all these living osteocytes here within the bone matrix relying on that blood supply to get the oxygen and the nutrients that they need. So obviously the tissue, the bone tissue, the cells where the injury occur are going to die, but actually non-damaged tissue can also die as a result of this disruption of the blood flow. So this disruption of the blood flow will actually cause a bone tissue in other regions to die as well. So this disruption of the blood flow causes undamaged bone cells to die as well. All right. And of course, remember not only is blood well vascularized, but blood is, I mean, bone is, bone is well vascularized, but bone is also heavily innervated. So the other thing that happens when we get this hematoma is it is very, very painful. Why is that important? Uh, for sending signals to send like oxytocin to help relieve pain and also to start the process of mending it. Absolutely. The, the damaged tissue is going to send out both electrical and chemical signals, which will uh, stimulate the healing process to begin. But why else is it important that it's painful? If you're out jogging. You know it's a break. Yeah. Well, if you're out jogging five miles and you break your leg one mile in, are you going to continue the rest of the four miles? No, because it hurts like heck. And so when it hurts like heck, that's the body's way of telling you, hey, this is injured, A, stop using it, and B, protect it so that it can heal. So being painful helps us to know that we're injured, so we're not going to go finish our rest of our five-mile run. Absolutely. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, so that is step one. We have that hematoma formation that occurs as a result of this injury. And as you mentioned, uh, the uh, connective tissue, pardon me, the, the damaged tissue, uh, the electrical signals are going to stimulate cells to divide. Now, where might we have some very, very useful pluripotent stem cells that might help us to heal this process and help us to repair this bone. The periosteum. Periosteum. Yeah, in the periosteum, we're going to have mesenchymal cells. Excellent. So here in the mesenchymal, pardon me, in the periosteum, We have mesenchymal cells. And these mesenchymal cells will divide to produce new cells. And of course, we've damaged our bone. So what type of cells do we want this mesenchymal cells to divide to become? So I can heal this process, I, I can heal this fracture? Steoblasts. Exactly. Absolutely. Those mesenchymal cells are going to divide and form fibroblasts and chondroblasts. Wait, what? That's not what you said, was it? No. We want to repair bone. So shouldn't we make osteoblasts? Uh, they need to have a, they need to have a, something to deposit on too. Apparently, 
And so that's exactly what happens. Our mesenchymal cells actually divide to produce fibroblasts. So what do fibroblasts make? Fibers. Yeah, they make the fibers. Fiber. There you go. It's not a trick question. Fibroblasts make fibers. And in this case, collagen fibers. And chondroblasts make what? Cartilage. They make cartilage. So what ends up happening in this space is we end up filling this space with a big, huge, thick cartilage that has a massive number of fi collagen fibers in it. Right? We've talked about something like that before. Let's cheat and do this so it stands out a little bit more. Fibrocartilage. Basically, we make a chunk of fibrocartilage. that fills the injured space. And because anatomists love to name everything, we call this the fibrocartilaginous cap. Or the fibrocartilaginous callus. Now, depending on the type of injury, this can occur in as little as a couple hours. This can occur relatively quickly. Why is that significant? First of all, why do we need it? Why put this cartilage in here to begin with? Because that is how you get to bone. True, it's like the you're right, first absolutely. Step. We know life is lazy, and we know that life easily can convert cartilage into bone. So that's a process we know, a process we understand, and that could be useful. Also, Does the advantage of- stabilize the bone? Yeah, absolutely. So the bone doesn't disrupt other parts of the body, doesn't move, it, it stays in place, it anchors it, uh, so that it gives us a stable structure to start the healing process in. Absolutely. So it doesn't move, it stabilizes it, and it can happen relatively quickly. And while you haven't thought of it in these terms, you may be aware of it because there you were on Sunday playing mud football with your friends like you always do in the fall and got tackled a little bit too hard, but right, being the manly man or the womanly woman that you are, you didn't wanna show that you were in pain, so you continued to play, even though your arm was sore and three days go by and your arm is still sore. And then finally, you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you have a broken bone. And often, what is the first thing the doctor has to do before they put you in a cast? Reset it. Yeah, re-break the bone, right? You hear about that all the time. Yeah, I went to the doctor and the doctor had to break my bone uh, so that they could set it. They're not really breaking the bone. But what may have to happen is that they may have to break up this fibrocartilaginous cap. Because after all, if you have a bone that is slightly displaced and then that fibrocartilaginous cap has formed together, is that necessarily how you want that bone to be aligned when it heals? No. No. So what they'll do is they'll go in and break up that fibrocartilaginous cap. They will then take the bones and realign the bones. And then that's typically when they cast it so that now that it's aligned, it will heal properly. So you often hear stories about people where they talk about their doctors having to re-break the bone. They're not actually breaking the bone, but what they are doing is sometimes breaking up that fibrocartilaginous cap so that they can align the bone properly so that it can heal. Now, once we've done that, as we know, we have the ability to convert cartilage to bone. And that is exactly what's going to happen. To do this, of course, we are gonna use osteoclasts. These osteoclasts are gonna break down the 
fibrocartilage. And they will break down any dead bone in the area. So with that fibrocartilage, pardon me, with those osteoclasts, they will start to break down the fibrocartilage, break down uh, any dead and damaged bone in the area. And of course, as the osteoclasts fill, clear out that space, then our osteoblasts will make bone in the area. Now, is this gonna necessarily make perfectly aligned compact bone? No. No, it is gonna fill the area with spongy bone. So those osteoblasts are going to come in and completely fill this space with a massive amount of spongy bone. And this big chunk of spongy bone that fills the area is not surprising what we call the bony callus. Or the bony cap. At this point, typically the cast comes off because our bone is totally healed, looks exactly like it did before, and we're all done with the process. No. So then why take the cast off now if it's not fully healed? Put stress on it. Exactly. As we know, stress on bones, and again, let's be careful, moderate stress on bones is important for the healing process. As we know, it stimulates uh, the osteoblasts to make more bone, and it aligns excuse me, the osteons. So in this case, a moderate amount of stress, the cast comes off. And as soon as that cast comes off, should you be running those five miles again like you were before? No, but a mile walk, right, with the dogs or something along those lines where you're starting to put some stress on it, starting to put some weight on it, can that help in the healing process? Absolutely, which leads us to our fourth step in the process. And that fourth step in the process is remodeling. In remodeling, we are going to make the bone similar to what it was before. We have to remove the spongy bone from the center. From the medullary cavity. So we got to get in here and hollow back out that medullary cavity so that we can fill it with bone marrow again. We also need to align compact bone around the shaft. So we're gonna take that compact bone and align it along where that injury was located. This process of remodeling can take months to years, depending on the type of injury. And does the bone ever become as strong as it was before? No. No, in fact, in most cases, it's actually stronger. Right. right. In fact, a bone, especially with a simple fracture like a transverse fracture, right? Now, when we're talking about like the compression fractures or things like that, yes, those are much harder for them to heal normally. But especially with a transverse or a spiral fracture, often they are much stronger than they were before. This bone heals entirely. 
once you look at the bone from the outer surface, it's almost impossible to tell it's been broken. And the only way you can tell it has been broken is in an x-ray. And when you look at a bone, uh, at an x-ray of a bone that has been broken, often what you see is that the compact bone in the diaphysis is thicker in that region. So the medullary cavity is more narrow in that region with more compact bone on the inside. And so with the x-ray, you can see that old fracture and it actually makes the bone stronger, makes it actually more likely to break in a different location than where it was broken the first time. All right, now again, a little bit of an oversimplification, different types of fractures may not heal stronger, but a common transverse fracture almost always heals stronger than it was before. All right, questions on that? Can you take a, an image of this and put it on canvas, please? Sure, I can do that. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry, hit clear, not save. There we go, did that. All right, and I can do that, but remember also, you got the great pictures from your textbook that do an even better job of showing this than mine does. So here we see that repair process. Again, it starts with the breaking of the bone and the bursting of those blood vessels, causing that hematoma to form in the area. Remember, obviously the bone that has been broken has been damaged, but remember, we will also, because of the disruption of blood flow, other areas of the bone can become damaged and die as well. The area becomes swollen and painful, making you aware that it's been injured so that you protect it and you don't use it. All right. Now that the hematoma has formed, the chemical signals from the damaged tissue, chemical signals from the blood are gonna stimulate these mesenchymal cells. And the mesenchymal cells are gonna divide. And what kind of new cells are they gonna produce? Fibroblasts. And? Fibroblasts. There you go, exactly. All right, our periosteum becomes active, not forming what we'd expect them to do in the forming of bone, but instead, Fibroblasts and chondroblasts make collagen fibers and connect and uh, cartilage, making a big, huge fibrocartilaginous callus, or like I said, what we also call the fibrocartilaginous cap. This stabilizes the bone, anchors the bone in place, doesn't allow the bone to move around, and sets a framework where we can heal the bone from this part. However, as we also talked about, if the bone's not properly aligned when this callus forms, then we often need to break up that callus so that the bone can be aligned properly before the healing begins. And as we said, luckily we know how to convert cartilage into bone. We are going to use osteoblasts to replace the cartilage, osteoclasts to remove the dead and damaged bone and the fibrocartilage. And what was fibrocartilage before becomes a big, huge chunk of spongy bone, what we call the bony callus or the bony cap. As we mentioned, this is often when the uh, cast comes off because now the fracture is stabilized with bone, granted spongy bone, but it's still bone. And so we want to be able to put a moderate amount of stress on it because as we know, stressing the bone compresses those hydroxyapatite crystals, produces that electrical current that stimulates the osteoblasts to make more bone matrix and to align the osteons. So this is gonna make the bone thicker. This is gonna make the bone stronger.
And that process of making the bone thicker and stronger is the process we call remodeling. As we talked about, this process can take months to years depending on the severity of the injury. But typically, at the end of this, we get a thicker, larger amount of compact bone in the region. And so typically, the bone is actually stronger in that spot than it was before, making the bone much more likely to break in a different location than the previous location. Now, again, like we said, sky is blue. This is not always the case, uh, but uh, frequently this is what occurs. And there you go. Our bone is healed. Questions on that? Yeah, I had a question. On the slide, it says uh, only compact bone remains. Uh, what, what does that mean exactly? Well, so remember, as we talked about, uh, this whole space is filled with spongy bone when, uh, when it was that bony callus. And so our goal of remodeling is to remove that, hollowing back out the medullary cavity. And remember, we also talked about typically in the site of the injury, the compact bone in the wall of the diaphysis is going to be thicker than it was before. So we get a little bit more compact bone and the medullary cavity is hollowed back out. So basically we've got a lot more compact bone, typically thicker than it was before uh, as a result of that. All right, excellent. Great question. Any others? All right, spectacular. With that, we are done with all of our bone physiology. So we are done with the skeletal system per se, uh, for the bones at least. But as we've talked about, uh, there is another component to this section. And the other component to this section, as I warned you about, is the arthroses right, or what we commonly refer to as the articulations, or what are also known as the joints. And so that is what we need to talk about next. Next, we are going to need to talk about uh, the different classifications of joints, organization of joints, and what they allow as far as movements go. So this is a good stopping point, natural stopping point. Let's go ahead and take our first break. We'll take a 15 minute break. We will restart at looks like 917. And at 917, you'll get to learn all these fun alphabet soup terms associated with joints. Any questions before we take our first break? All right, I will see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty, let's go ahead and get started. The last bit of new information we have for Thursday's exam is to talk about our joints. And again, as we mentioned, joints are also known as articulations or as arthroses. And basically the simple definition of a joint is where two bones are held together by some type of connective tissue. What are the functions of joints? Movement. Move absolutely. They give flexibility of movement while also holding our bones together into our skeleton. Right. We're going to we're spending all this time learning about the individual bones. But remember, the point is also to put these bones together into a fully functional skeleton that also allows movements. Excellent. Per perfect. Of course, the study of joints is the field of arthrology and the study of the movement of the of the joint. Uh, pardon me, the movement of the body that the joints allow is, of course, the field of kinesiology. Now. 
as the handout on uh, our, uh, as your book talks about, as the handout on Canvas talks about, when we talk about joint classifications, there are basically three ways to talk about our joint classifications. Uh, first, we can talk about the functional classifications and the functional classifications of our joints basically relate to the amount of movement the joint allows. And as it turns out, there are three functional classifications. Our structural classifications as the name would seem to indicate, uh, revolves how the joints are made, or more specifically, there's actually two characteristics to the structural classification. Oops, so I spell classification right. And they are the type of connective tissue that holds the two bones together. And the second possible characteristic is whether or not a joint cavity is present. So either it has a joint cavity or it does not have a joint cavity. And there are four structural classifications. And of course, if we've learned anything in this class, uh, we know that there is definitely a relationship between structure and function. So is there a relationship between the structural classifications and the functional classifications of our joints? Yes. Yes. Excellent. So when identifying joints, there are three ways we can do that. A functional classification, uh, a structural classification, but as we also need to talk about, most, but not all, Most of our structural classifications have what we call specific types of joints. And so as we go through all of our structural classifications, we will also need to be able to identify, oops, hold on, oh well, that works, our, uh, it doesn't work specific types of joints. So on the exam, I may point at a joint of the body and I could ask one of these three questions. Identify the functional classification and how many possible correct answers could there be for that? Yeah, three. I could ask you to identify the structural classification of the joint and how many possible right answers are there for that? Four. Four. Or I could point at the joint and ask you for the specific type. So it is going to be important to be able to organize this information. Your textbook does a nice job of doing this. Uh, that lab handout does a nice job of doing this. But let's go ahead and do this ourselves as well on a clear piece of whiteboard. We will start first with our functional classifications of our joints. And how many of those did we say there were? Three. Three. And when we talk about the functional classifications of our joints, what does that really mean? What does that relate to? How they're moving. Okay. How they move. mm -hmm. Exactly. This relates to the amount of movement they allow. Excellent. 
The first functional classification is what is known as a sin arthrosis. Now again, arthrosis is a fancy word for joint. So sin is the prefix for that. So any idea how much movement a sin arthrosis allows between the bones? None. Exactly. With a sin arthrosis, this type of joint allows no movement. Where did we talk about we had joints that didn't allow any movement? Were they at sutures? Yeah, remember up here in the skull, these joints between our bones, we said we didn't allow movement. So those would be examples of synarthroses. And again, fun with vocabulary. Synarthrosis, I-S is the singular. Synarthroses, E-S is the plural. Synarthritic would be the adjective that describes the joint. So again, they all mean the same thing. It's all a way of saying that it doesn't allow any movement. All right. The second functional classification is an amphiarthrosis. Oops. Yep. Now, when I say amphi, what does that make you think of? Amphibious. Amphibious or amphibians. And what's special about amphibians? I can live in the water or on land. Yeah. They're not, they're not fully land animals. They're also not fully water animals. They're kind of in between. Well, this is an arthrosis, a joint that is in between. It's not fully non-moving like a synarthrosis but it also doesn't allow free movement as well. So this is a joint that allows a limited range of motion. Uh, we talked earlier when we were talking about fibrocartilage about the pubic symphysis. Remember the pubic symphysis is where the two pubic bones come together. We talked about how it has to have a little bit of flexibility and give to allow baby through the pelvis. And we talked about how the hormones that a female produces when pregnant make that pubic symphysis a little bit more flexible to be able to allow that baby to pass through. But it's not allowing you to swing your pelvis open and close like a, you know, like a barn door or anything like that. It might be easy to get the baby out that way, but it doesn't work that way. So those allow a limited range of motion. And that is what we call an amphiarthrosis. Which leads us to our third functional classification, a diarthrosis. And a diarthrosis is a joint that allows a full range of motion, or let's say it this way, free range of motion. However, we do have to put an asterisk here. And that asterisk comes in the form of that it can be limited by the axis of movement. For instance, here between the phalanges of my fingers, I have a diarthritic joint that allows a full range of motion, allow me to be able to flex this up and down in a full range of motion. However, can I take my finger and bend it to the side like this? Well, I guess technically I could, but then I'm going to the doctor immediately afterwards, right? Because it's not meant to bend that way. Unlike the joint between my phalanges and my metacarpals. Notice those also have a free range of motion up and down, but they also have a free range of motion left and right. So some can have just one axis of movement, some can have two, and some can even have more axes. So a diarthritic joint does allow a free range of motion, but it doesn't mean that it can just go any old place. It can be and often is limited by the axis of movement. 
So there you go. Just that simply, we have identified and described our three functional classifications for our joints. Questions on that? All right, perfect. So if we are comfortable with that, then let's move over here and talk about the structural classifications of joints. And someone remind me again, how many of those we have? Four. Four. Excellent. And remember, there are two ways that we categorize these. One is the type of connective tissue that holds the bones together. And two, uh, whether or not there is a joint cavity present. So those are the two categories that we are going to use to identify our structural classifications. Now, let's go ahead and start with the first. The first is what is called a synostosis. Now remember, this is identified uh, by the type of connective tissue that holds it together and whether or not there's a joint cavity. I will tell you right off the bat with a synostosis, there is no joint cavity. What type of connective tissue do you think holds the two bones together with a synostosis? Might be kind of hard to figure it out from the name. So why don't I give you the common term for this joint? Now I will warn you right now, do not use this common term on the exam. Some of you, despite my warnings, wrote earwax instead of cerumen, wrote cuticle or nail bed instead of eponychium and hyponychium, and you did get partial credit for those on the exam, but you will not get partial credit for this one. Do not use this term. The only reason I'm giving you this term is because it will hopefully help you figure out what connective tissue holds the bones together. These joints are sometimes referred to as bony joints. And now that I've said that, what type of connective tissue do you think holds together the two bones with a synostosis? Osseous tissue? Yeah, by bone connective tissue. Or again, if it's easier to remember because we want to distinguish bone organ from bone connective tissue, you could say osseous connective tissue. Excellent. So you have two bones held together by a little bit of bone connective tissue. Now, as we have also talked about, there is clearly a relationship between functional classifications and structural classifications. If you have two bones that are being held together by bone connective tissue, what do you think the functional classification of that type of joint might be? Thin arthrosis. There you go. So, this is the kind of thing that you can call grandma up on the phone after class to say, hey, guess what, grandma? Synarthroses are synarthritic. And she'll be very impressed and she'll send you $5 in the mail. But basically all you've told her is that two bones that are held together by bone connective tissue don't move. Fun with vocabulary. All right. The good news is it gets a little easier from here. Our second structural classification are fibrous joints. Right. Once again, with a fibrous joint, there is no joint cavity. 
And with a fibrous joint, the two bones are held together by what? Fibrous connective tissue. Fibrous connective yeah. tissue. By some type of fibrous connective tissue. There you go. See how easy that is? Third type is a cartilaginous joint. Again, cartilaginous joints have no joint cavities. And with the cartilaginous joints, the two bones are held together by cartilage connective tissue. There you go. And our fourth structural classification is a synovial joint. Now, notice our two criteria for structural classifications are the type of connective tissue that holds them together and whether or not a joint cavity is present. Notice none of the first three types had joint cavities, but We've already talked a little bit about synovial joints because we talked about that they are, of course, lined by a synovial, a synovial membranes. And what did synovial membranes make? A cavity. Well, they the made synovial, fluid. synovial fluid that filled the joint cavity. So clearly, this one has a joint cavity and is lined by a synovial membranes. And there's going to be some other characteristics that we're going to use to describe them as well. So there you go. Those are our four structural classifications. Synostosis, fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. Questions on that? Are we going to review the functions of the other three? Yes, absolutely. We are going to talk about the how they relate to the functional classifications. But remember also, as I mentioned, with our structural classifications, they will also have specific types. Now, if you've got two bones together, held together by bone connective tissue, are there really a lot of different types that you can have for something like that? No, and remember I said most structural classifications have a specific types. Synostosis is the exception. But with a fibrous connective tissue, here fibrous connective tissues have three specific types of joints. Sneak that up there. No, it's not going to fit. Never mind. All right, we'll make this work. Three specific types of joints. Let's inset that a little bit. The first of these is your friend and mine, what we've already talked about a suture. Again, a suture is where two bones are held together by thin fibrous connective tissue. And as we've talked about with a suture, right, um, that fibrous connective tissue that holds them together, where are they found? Where do we find our sutures? Intestinal. Yeah. So sutures are located in the skull only, holding those two bones together. And what, to answer your question now, is the functional classification of a suture? Synarthrosis. There you go. Now, something else interesting happens with the sutures. With the sutures, again, this is easier to do when we've been in the classroom, we've had a chance to look at the skulls for a while. Yes, when we are first born, 
this bones of the sutures, I mean, the bones of the skull aren't even fully put together yet. So we have things like the fontanelles and those sutures slowly form. And so as they come together, but as we age, it's a bunch of collagen fibers that hold this together. And as we know, osteoblasts love to deposit bone matrix on collagen fibers. So as we age, what ends up happening to these sutures is the fibers that are holding them together get bone matrix deposited on them. So what actually ends up happening as we age is they actually become a synostosis. So we have these joints that are called sutures, but if we were actually in the classroom and looked at them in the classroom, you would see that every single one of our sutures is technically a synostosis because we don't have any infant skulls, any young skulls, all the skulls we have are old skulls and all the sutures have completely ossified. But we still call them sutures, even though technically they have completely ossified. Ooh, uh, need to cheat. Let's see if, let's see how good that website is at Cosumnes River. Not what I wanted. <laughs> no, although that's good to know. <laughs> Good. All right. Uh, where do I have it? Let me see if I can find it this way. This will work. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Sorry, if I was clever, I would have gotten this set up ahead of time, but I didn't. So, but that gives you a chance to stop typing for a moment, and that works too. All right. Our second specific type of fibrous joint is what is called, oops, wrong size. a syndesmosis. What a syndesmosis is, is a basically um, fibrous connective tissue, a ligament or tendon, or, I'm sorry, ligament, not tendon, a ligament or a uh, osseous membrane that holds the two bones together. We'll look at the pretty picture in your textbook that shows this in just a minute. But where I find it useful to see something like this is if we actually look at the chart that is in our classroom. Here is a picture of the chart. We can see the skeleton that is here. And what I wanna do in particular is look down here where our radius and ulna come together. Notice here, we see some examples of some ligaments that help to stabilize it, and that would be a decent example. Are you guys able to see this uh, up close view? Are you seeing this? Yes. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Notice we have the two bones here that are the radius and the ulna. And in between these two, you will notice that there is this fibrous membrane that holds and stabilizes the di diaphyses of these two bones together. Notice the two bones, the radius, and the ulna, they don't get to swing back and forth in relation to each other. But 
what they do have the ability to do is kind of rotate and move along the surfaces of each other. So this type of joint, which we see here in between the two parallel bones, the radius and the ulna. And can I also, let's say, I wonder if I have to go back. How do I do this? There we go. Oh, it doesn't show the lower part. You'll also see it between the tibia and the fibula as well. Here's another view on the other side. This interosseous membrane in between the two bones is another example of one of these syndesmoses. And as you can see from this illustration, again, is it going to allow free range of motion between the bones? No. no. But is it going to allow no movement between the bones? No. 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 So notice functionally, a syndesmosis is an amphiarthrosis. And that brings us to our third specific type of fibrous joint. And it is by far my favoriteest one to say. It is a gumphosis. And gumphosis is very fun to say, but the name also tells you everything about it. Because if you had a piece of gum, where would you put it? In your mouth. Exactly. A gumphosis is actually the joint between your bones, the jaw, the mandible, and the maxilla. And the, t the bone like structures, the teeth. Notice I did say bone like structures. We learned the 80 bones of the axial skeleton. And were the teeth a part of that? No. no. Teeth have those same hydroxyapatite crystals on the enamel, but remember they don't have the collagen fiber. And at the center, they're actually made of this special material called dentin that is actually more similar to like the calcified cartilage that we've seen and talked about a couple of times. So teeth are not bones, but they're bone-like enough that to form the joint between the tooth and the uh, joint cavity, the little alveoli in the mandible and the maxilla, we have a small fibrous connective tissue. And I know I'm doing this all with words here. We do have the pretty pictures from the textbook that I will show you guys all of these. Uh, but we have a fibrous membrane that actually holds the tooth in place. And that joint between the jaw and the tooth is called a gumphosis. And how much should your teeth wiggle around inside of your jaw? No. So what would the functional classification of a gumphosis be? Excellent. There you go. Questions on those? All right, excellent. That brings us to our cartilaginous joints. Cartilaginous joints are held together by cartilage connective tissue. And how many types of cartilage, specific types of cartilage do we have? Three. Three. What are they again? Hyaline. Fibrous and elastic. There you go, excellent. Elastic, that's the stuff that we have here in our ears, right? Would it make a lot of sense to use this type of connective tissue to hold two bones together? Yeah. Would that really stabilize them or anything? No, they would flop around all over the place. But that does still leave us hyaline cartilage and that does still leave us fibrocartilage. So not surprisingly, there are two specific types of uh, cartilaginous joints. And those two specific types are determined by the type of cartilage. The first 
is a synchondrosis. Again, this is where I mentioned uh, a lot of the alphabet soup, a lot of the vocabulary is what makes these joints challenging. The information itself isn't that challenging. A synchondrosis is basically just two joints that are held together by hyaline cartilage. So a synchondrosis uses hyaline cartilage. Now, synchondrosis use hyaline cartilage to hold bones together. One of the classic examples is in our first rib and our manubrium. We talked about ribs in the last class. We talked about how there's typical ribs and atypical ribs. But I'm sure as you've been looking at your 30-point skeletal review, you know that one rib is very different from all the others. Well, what is the point of our ribs? Someone describe me again what the function of our ribs are. Structure, protection. Structure and protection. That, I'm sorry, what thoracic was the last one? Uh, to create the thoracic cavity for your organs. Excellent. And absolutely, it positively does that and is vitally important. But again, a big tube of bone would also form that cavity, would also provide that protection. So there's one other important thing that our ribs allow us to do. What makes the world go round? Air and expansion. Pressure. Pressure is what makes the world go round. I'm sure I've told you that already in this class. If I haven't, shame on me. Uh, but yes, absolutely, right? Some people think it's money. Some people think it's love. Pressure is what makes the world go round. And as was mentioned, right, when we are, our ribs actually kind of work kind of like a handle of a pail, if you think about it. They have the ability to swing up and down. And as they swing up, that increases the space in our thoracic cavity. And when volume goes up, pressure goes down. And when pressure goes down, air moves in. When we lower the ribs, volume goes down, pressure goes out, and the air moves out. So that ability to change the shape of our ribs, changes the shape of the thoracic cavity, moves air in and out of our lungs. But just like that handle of a bucket, you need a pivot point. And that's what the first rib does. That first rib locks in place with hyaline cartilage. And if you've got a pivot point like that, do you want that pivot point to move? No. Uh. Now, conceptually, this could be a little hard to understand. So let's take it back to something else we understand. How about the epiphyseal plate? The epiphyseal plate is hyaline cartilage that holds the head of a bone to the diaphysis of the bone. Well, you could argue that's a joint. You have hyaline cartilage holding two bones together. So that would be an example of a synchondrosis. And how much should your head of your bone wobble around on top of that diaphysis? None. None. So not surprisingly, the functional classification of a synchondrosis is a? Synarthrosis. Excellent. Lastly, the second one, oops, blue, is one we've already talked about. A symphysis. A symphysis is a joint that uses fibrocartilage to form the joint between. One of the interesting things about these symphyses is we've already talked about the pubic symphysis that allows some flexibility of movement. But remember also we talked about the bones of the vertebrae are held together by little chunks of fibrocartilage as well. Those joints between the vertebrae are made our symphyses as well. So notice all of our symphyses are all found on the midline of the body. So the pubic symphysis, the intervertebral discs all are along the midline of the body. And as we've already mentioned a couple times, what is the functional classification of a symphysis? Amphiarthrosis. There you go.
There we go. And let's go back and add one more small little piece. Notice when we were talking about synchondrosis, we used the example of the epiphyseal plate. But what happens when it becomes the epiphyseal line? What kind of joint does that joint between the head and the diaphysis become? Synos. Excellent. So that epiphyseal line, when it fuses, becomes a synostosis. Excellent. All right, so far so good. And hopefully you've noticed one other big factor as well. Notice every single structural classification, every single specific type we have talked about so far has either been a synarthrosis or an amphiarthrosis. We haven't identified any diarthroses yet. And that's because the only joints that are diarthroses are synovial joints. All synovial joints are diarthroses. And all diarthritic all diarthritic joints are synovial. So if you have a synovial joint, you know it is diarthritic. If you have a diarthritic joint, you know it is synovial. These two go hand in hand. So the only thing we have left to do with the synovial joints is remember, as we said, the anatomy is slightly more complicated. So we have to identify the anatomy of our synovial joints. And we also have to talk about the specific types. Anybody have any idea how many specific types there are for synovial joints? And peeked ahead at the material. She Six. didn't look at the handout. There you go. Six, bingo. And again, all six specific types, which are, again, are determined by the shape of the bones that form the joints. They're going to determine the movements they allow, but all of them are going to be diarthritic. All right, we've done this on the board. Let's quickly go through this with the pretty pictures on your textbook as well. As I mentioned, our functional classifications are, are determined by the amount of movement they allow the bone. Synarthrosis allows how much movement? Zero. Amphiarthrosis allows how much movement? Limited. Yeah, some limited range of motion. And a diarthritosis allows a free range of motion limited by axes. And for structural classifications, we determine the structural classifications by whether or not there is a joint cavity and the type of connective tissue. What type of connective tissue holds together bones with a synostosis? Fibrous. Nope. Synostosis is. Sure. Yeah, bone connective tissue, bone osseous connect. connective tissue. Excellent. What kind of connective tissue holds fibrous joints together? Connective fibrous tissue. Connective. Yeah, fibrous connective tissue, cartilaginous, cartilage, and synovial has the cavity, has the membrane. Like I said, we have to talk more about that one. We'll get to those. But let's look at our others. Now that we know the structural classifications, we can talk about the specific types. We'll start with our fibrous joints. Again, they lack a synovial cavity. 
They have some type of fibrous connective tissue and will either allow little or no movement. Starting first here with our suture, only found in the skull, typically very undulating uh, joints, fibrous connective tissue that holds them together, just that little linear structure. And of course, with that type of structure, as we mentioned, it is a synarthritic joint. But as we also talked about, these fibers can ossify, and when they ossify, it becomes a synostosis, even though we'll still call them sutures. Here we see an example of that ligament type of syndesmosis at the distal end of the radius in the ulna. But remember also with this, there can be that interosseous membrane between the two parallel bones that hold them together. So I mentioned the same thing is found here between the radius and the ulna. I mean, pardon me, between the tibia and the fibula, like we saw between the radius and the ulna. These, of course, allow limited movement. So they're amphiarthroses. And then, like I said, my favorite one to say, the gum phosis. Notice here with the gum phosis, we have the pocket or the alveolus of the bone. In this case, it would be the mandible because it's the lower jaw. Notice we also have the bone-like structure that is the tooth. We'll worry about the anatomy of the tooth when we get to the digestive system, so we don't have to worry about it now. But we know it's not a bone, but it is a bone-like structure. And if you look closely at this illustration, you can see that there's this fibrous connective tissue structure that holds them together. It is actually what is called the periodontal ligament. Notice if this happened to be a baby tooth, one of the things that would happen would be our grown up tooth would start growing upward from underneath, breaking away the root of the baby tooth and also breaking down the periodontal ligament, which is why then our baby tooth pops out. And of course, before they pop out, should that tooth wiggle around inside of the socket of your mouth? No, Not sorry. before it needs to come out. Of course, it is a synarthrosis. Here we see examples of cartilaginous joints. Again, no cavity held together by two of the three cartilages. Fiber, car I mean, uh, elastic cartilage would be silly. That would, you know, wouldn't provide any structure, flop all over the place. That would be a bad thing. So either hyaline or fibrocartilage. Here we see the ones formed with hyaline cartilage, what we call a synchondrosis. Right. We've already talked about the growth plate. That's an easy example. And then we also talked about that first joint, that special joint between that special first rib and the manubrium, forming the pivot point for our rib cage. And of course, those are synarthroses. Pyphyseal plate, when it ossifies, would become a synostosis. And here we see the pubic symphysis. And remember also, the intervertebral discs of our vertebral column would all be examples of symphyses, where we have fiber cartilage. And notice they're all located just along the midline of the body. And they allow a limited range of motion. Lastly, as I mentioned, here we see the six specific types of synovial joints. And notice their names are based on the shape of the bones and their articulations. And of course, their shape is going to determine the axes of motion that they allow. But remember, one of the key is that all of these, no matter which of the six types they are, all synovial joints are diarthritic. They allow a free range of motion. And only diarthritic joints are synovial joints. So we will talk about the anatomy of a synovial joint and the six specific types in our next class. 
So that is all I wanted to cover for a lecture standpoint for today, because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for our bones and bone features. All right, so let's actually start by going back here. So again, this is where we are right now. Like I said, we still need to talk about our synovial joints, both their anatomy and the specific types and the movement they allow. But the rest of it, we've hopefully got covered and are made some sense of. So any questions on the joint stuff we have talked about so far? All right, excellent. From that then, uh, we are going to break up into our groups again and do our group presentations. But before we do that, I wanna do a quick introduction. We have moved on, oops, no, stay there, to the appendicular skeleton. Uh, let's start easy. How many bones in the appendicular skeleton? One hundred twenty-six. There you go. How did you know that? Because you counted them all. Two oh two oh six minus eighty. There you go. Exactly. We knew there were eighty in the axial, two hundred six name bones. So there are one hundred twenty-six bones in the appendicular skeleton. And the awesome thing about them is that they're all paired. Right, these are all paired bones, which means really you're only learning 63 new bones. So that is a cool thing. You only really have 63 new bones you need to learn. However, for all of them, we do need to be able to distinguish right versus left, because that absolutely matters. So hopefully our groups as they're presenting today will help us to be able to distinguish right versus left. And remember, in our axial skeleton, there were three main structures that we formed. Skull, vertebral column, bony thorax. How many structures make up the appendicular skeleton? Three. Close. Four, four, sorry, four. There you go. There are four structures. And again, we are talking per side. Because again, for the most part, we can just talk about one side of these. Those four structures are, of course, the easy ones, the upper limb and the lower limb. What does that leave us with? Lower girdle. Exactly. It leaves us with the girdles. Girdles, by definition, are basically structures that attach the limb to the axial skeleton. And so we have two girdles. And which one was the one you mentioned? Pelvic. The pelvic girdle, which as we will learn uh, from a group that is gonna be presenting, uh, that pelvic girdle uh, is not the same thing as the pelvis. Right, our pelvic girdle is, oops, not our pelvis. It's something different but it attaches the lower limb to our axial skeleton. And what's the other one? Shoulder blades, I don't know what it's. Pectoral. And you're right, our pectoral girdle is what attaches our upper arm to our axial skeleton. And here we have a pretty picture that shows these uh, axial and uh, pardon me the axial and the appendicular skeleton and I think I have one more here we go from the back view go ahead and clear that we can see those four structures we can see there's our pectoral girdle here's our pelvic girdle and of course the upper limb and lower limb our goal today is going to be to try to get through everything associated with the upper and then the lower. And again, these are paired structures, so we're just gonna focus on one side. When we focus on that one side, right, how many bones make up the pectoral girdle? There you go, Samuel's got it, two. 
Anyone know what they are? Scapula and the clavicle. There you go. It is the clavicle and the scapula. Right? Again, notice their job is to attach the upper limb to the axial skeleton. And you'll also notice that only occurs here. This right here, the attachment of the clavicle to the manubrium is the only bony attachment of the arm and the shoulder girdle or the pectoral girdle to the axial skeleton. Yes, there's ligaments, tendons, right, muscles, uh, skin helping to hold that all in place, but this is the only bony attachment. Has anyone ever broken their clavicle or seen someone break their clavicle before? Yeah. Did it happen to you, Brian, or you saw it happen on someone else? I uh, saw it happen to somebody else. Thankfully, right. I've never broken a bone. Excellent. What did it look like when it occurred? Like kind of caved in like they're... Yeah, exactly. This, is the, this bony attachment in the clavicle basically is what gives us our vertical axis. So when they break that, basically the whole shoulder, basically the whole arm collapses inward. All right. Notice the advantage of this is massive range of motion. We have massive range of motion at our arms, but structurally it's not very sound, right? How long can you stand for? Long time. Yeah, pretty much ever, right? Hours, maybe days if you really had to. How long can you hold yourself in a planking position? All right, I'm not even asking you to do push-ups. I'm not asking you to hold up all your weight. All I'm asking you is to hold yourself in a planking position. How long can you do that for? Anyone ever planked before? A couple minutes. Yeah, a couple minutes, that, and that's pretty high. Most people can't even do it that long, right? So again, big difference between a couple minutes and hours. And the big difference, right, is the structural soundness of this. So absolutely, we have this structure specialized for dexterity, specialized for movement, not specialized for structure, for strength. Excellent. Then we get to the limb. How many bones in the upper portion of the limb? One. What is it? The humerus. There you go. How many bones in the lower part of the limb? Two. Two. What are they? Radius and ulna. Radius and ulna. Excellent. How many in the hand? Well, how many in the wrist? Let's go easy. How many in the wrist? Eight. Eight. These bones collectively are known as what? Carpals. Carpals, but we do have to know each bone individually. And then how many bones in the hand? Anybody know? Hopefully somebody knows because they're presenting it today. Is it 28? Not quite that many. I think you're thinking of including the wrist. If we take the wrist out, that gets us a lot closer. That would be 20, but it would only be 20 if bones were equally distributed through all fingers or bones equally. 19. There you go, exactly. So there are indeed 19 in the hand. Excellent. All righty, so that's our game plan for today. Our game plan for today will be to go through these individual bones and point out just the bones and bone features that are on our list that we are responsible for as well as helping us to try to distinguish left from right. All right, questions on that? All righty, let's go ahead and take our first break, I mean, our second break. During this break also, we'll break into groups so you guys have a chance to talk a little bit. So let's take a little bit of a longer break. Uh, let's go ahead, it's, uh, what, it's 10, 12 right now. So 15 minutes would be 28. Let's go. Uh, We'll go to 1040. That should give us enough time. That gives us two hours. 1040, uh, we will go ahead and restart and we will work on our group presentations at that point. So go ahead, go run quick, take a quick break, go to the bathroom, do all those things. That'll give me a minute to get you guys broken up into your groups. And then once I get you guys broken up into your groups, uh, we'll, uh, I'll close the rooms and we'll meet back here at 1040. All right, any questions? All right, I will see you guys after the break.